Hello, everyone. Um, I see people are still joining in, but I think it's uh, it's time to start. So we are going to hold this roundtable on the future of telecommunications, the role of telecom companies and big tech, which will be moderated by Tony Shortall. Uh, those of you who do not know Tony, he is a director of Telage, a consultancy in the field of telecommunications, economics and regulation. Prior to that position, Tony was working at, at the, as a senior economist at the European Commission, and he was involved in, uh, in the works on the 2002 and 2009 regulatory framework, and he's been also involved in the termination, in the works on the term, uh, termination regulation. Um, also, uh, I wanted to let you know that this roundtable is complementary to the course that we have just concluded today, which was on very high capacity networks regulation, competition and investment. It was a five week online course. And during this final class that we had today with Tony, we have approached this topic uh, from a more academic and theoretical perspective. So this round table complements the lecture by providing a more policy oriented view uh, and is complemented of course by the views expressed by different types of stakeholders. So with that, I would be happy to pass, um, let's say the control and management of the session to Tony, who will introduce all the speaker, speakers and the rules for the round table. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and welcome to this panel discussion. Um, so I am very pleased to have such eminent speakers with me today. Um, so we have Johan Kettler, who I think everybody uh, knows uh, from his previous incarnations with ACM and with uh, uh, Facebook, but who is now, uh, actually, I'm not sure your title, but now with Oxera. And he is, uh, as several people on this panel are, an economist by training. And so he's going to bring an economic perspective uh, to the discussion. We have, from uh, industry, we have uh, Marit Palavirta, who is a uh, representative from Etno, uh, the representative of the largest operators in Europe. Um, we have Luke Hendricks from ECTA, the director of ECTA, who is, uh, which is the association which represents alternative operators or entrant operators. Uh, in the telecom market. And finally, uh, I'd like to have Pier Luigi Parsu with us, who's director of the Florence School. Um, and yeah, so as Anna just outlined, we just had a lecture discussing uh, kind of a, a number of issues uh, in the sector. <clears throat> and I suppose I'd like to place maybe just a moment of background to maybe put a little context uh, in place. So there are a lot of changes happening uh, in telecom markets. We have seen with the code, the EECC here in Europe, that we have uh, had an acceleration of investment in fiber networks. And the code has set out kind of a pro-investment uh, framework, which encourages end-to-end -end network competition between operators and that has been quite successful. Now, a lot of the provisions in the code rely on separation remedies in one form or another, that could be co-investment, could be wholesale only, uh, or it could be something else. And what we've seen is that uh, a new category of investor, so specifically uh, long-term investors have started to invest quite significantly in telecom markets. Now, long-term investors, have a lower cost of capital, much lower than vertically integrated operators. And so where that happens at scale, it can be quite a daunting prospect. Uh, and there's a question mark about the extent to which uh, the two different business models can coexist or how they can coexist into the future. In addition, we see a kind of a general trend uh, also you know, with open run and so on, but a kind of a, as part of a general trend, I would say of virtualization, softwareization of networks. And we see network intelligence very much being separated out from the physical network itself. Um, and in a sense, 
those very high-end network services are themselves being disintermediated from the network. And so by that, we could end up with much more contestable uh, telecom markets, but where the intelligence and the value is not linked to the network itself. So for instance, it could be that uh, digital platforms or OTT or whoever you, whatever word you choose, uh, may be the telecom operators of the future, which again is a kind of a daunting uh, uh, issue in the sector. And finally then, what we've seen also as part of the COVID pandemic is that there's been a kind of a, a shift in working to online. We've seen a large increase in data traffic. So data traffic is growing long-term trend about 20% per annum. Um, and we see not only that volumes have changed, but also that it's becoming more asymmetric. Um, and also there's a concentration of traffic uh, this has led to a discussion about which we're here today with. I would say there's a certain nervousness uh, in the sector, uh, particularly among some of the larger operators, but that there's a kind of a concern about whether everybody is contributing in an appropriate way to the cost of network, that everybody's place in the ecosystem is appropriate. Uh, and I would classify it in that sort of those broad terms. I suppose the discussion was kicked off in a way by uh, a paper, a series of papers by Vodafone and Ethno, uh, which they commissioned by Axon and Frontier, which looked at the costs of traffic and whether there was an appropriate distribution of cost amongst the operators. And then we've seen a number of comments from the commission, though nothing in writing and such, uh, on this. Uh, and we've seen a response from Beric on the specific issue about whether uh, IP interconnect would be an appropriate vehicle to raise funds. I think the short answer there would be no, it's not. Um, so uh, that's, sorry, that's as much in a sense as I'm going to say on this, uh, probably already spoken too much. But uh, I suppose I'd like to start, I'm going to ask Marit first. Um, just a, sort of a, a kind of a maybe an introductory uh, thing, you know, so just to understand what the issue is. So you perceive that that the issue that we should be discussing is that online platforms basically aren't paying enough to network operators uh, for network costs. So Marit, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tony and um, Anna, for the kind introductions and for the invitation to this exciting session. So it's indeed quite a hot topic uh, here in Brussels. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to kind of define, uh, well, run you through some of the main, uh, if you like, dynamics that we're seeing currently uh, then, uh, that have also then uh, led to us, as you said, to, to commission uh, the study that we did with Axon and, and also then to explore this idea of what we call the fair contribution further in, in the policy discussion. So. Tony, you mentioned already some of the drivers, I think, that we're seeing in the markets or the parallel dynamics. But from our point of view, the most important ones are indeed the ever-increasing data traffic volumes that you know, are going up a lot. And when we're looking into the mid to long-term future, and we're now seeing services, new services being prospected, such as the metaverse, for example, we don't see an end to the increase of this uh, data traffic. And I'm just, uh, just to give you an idea, so uh, Arthur Little, they published a paper recently and uh, they say that the average virtual reality metaverse user requires five to 40 times more data than it takes to stream an HD video. So just to give you an idea that the kind of exponential growth is still something that we expect to continue. Now, you know, and you said it yourself, and then what we see also is that this data traffic is kind of more concentrated now to a, let's say, a well, small group, relatively small group of companies, content generators. And I think that's, you know, the way that you also describe them. So they tend to come from the so-called global internet giants, if you like. Now, this in itself is, is not necessarily bad news, right? I mean, more data is good news for all of us. 
But then when we look at the market dynamics more, more in detail, uh, what we are perceiving is an asymmetry, a very specific asymmetry in negotiation power. So between our members, the European operators and these large content providers. And this is most concretely present in the IP interconnection practices. So IP interconnection is, of course, the, the concrete place where the data, let's say, changes hands. So it is shifted from the content providers to the network operators, to the national networks. Um, and, and this is a point where we have been seeing that, in fact, it is more and more difficult on pure commercial terms to come to an agreement between the two parties that would be satisfactory for both parties. Um, and, and just to make it clear, so of course, payment is paid peering is already a very common practice between large players. So it is not something new in the markets. And in parallel, then what we also observe is that the markets and especially also the IP interconnection market is changing. So there is more and more proprietary infrastructure. So CDNs on net caches. Um, provided by the, the large content generators that are coming closer to the end user location, which of course you can argue that on one hand is good because it, let's say, brings the heavy traffic closer to the end user. But also then if we look at the markets framing in the European context, it can also, then you can question a little bit the market definition that we currently have of the IP interconnection market. So pairing transit, you know, where does the CDNs come to play? Are we, are we really looking at the right picture at this moment in time when we on one hand look at the regulatory regimes and then what is actually happening on the markets? And also then the fact that we of course agree that, well, all internet end users should be equal. But the fact that there are now these CDNs and on net caches, you could also then argue that there seems to be a clear shift from being for the big internet giants just to be an you know, end user. And they rather should be considered perhaps an ISP's customer already at this stage. And a final point is then a regulatory asymmetry. So I think all the panelists have worked with regulation for much longer than I have. And um, you know very well that our sector is subject to intrusive regulatory frameworks, uh, including pricing, competition policy, open internet rules. And I'm sure that there were good reasons in the past to put this in place and good intentions, but there is now clearly a gap and, and um, let's say, yeah, a gap between the regulation that on one hand is subject to our sector and then um, the, let's say, lack of regulation that we see for the large content providers. So we find ourselves as operators in a position that because of the data traffic and because these asymmetries, we are having to continuously invest, upgrade, redimension, invest our networks to make sure that end, user of, end users, of course, get this data traffic um, in a good quality way. And you can, of course, say that this is part of the business of being an operator, absolutely. But when you add the, as I said, the commercial and regulatory symmetry, it just no longer seems to really add up and no longer really seems fair. And especially as we know that based on this, let's say free internet access, these global internet giants of course generate enormous wealth and value out of their services by using their multi-sided uh, markets and, and business models. So that's why where we believe that we should now be, you know, exploring this discussion about the telecom sector potentially becoming a two-sided market so that we can also then ensure the financial sustainability of our sector in the future. And of course, also vis-a-vis -vis the challenges that, and the changes that you outlined, Tony, in your, in your introduction in the telecom market at large. So I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Marit. Um, sorry, I'm going to go to Luke now and ask him how he sees it. Basically, you know, is there a question or is there a problem uh, of online platforms not being sufficiently to network operators? Um, because you represent another set of operators, as it were, which are mostly distinct from Marit's. Yeah, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Anna, for the invitation to this uh, to this debate. Uh, let me respond and 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 comment in in a kind different way. Okay. 
the first thing I would like to say is that I think that in this debate, it has been very emotional and even more than emotional over the last months. And we should uh, stay cool with that and, and really look at the facts. And I think there will be a, com uh, a, a consultation coming. And I think it's very important that we all read this, what will be in the consultation and that we can then begin to discuss and see what will be the consequences of that. And I hope it will come soon, hopefully beginning of next year, so that we can all deserve a, a good family period between Christmas and New Year. Uh, but what is important is that we that we have soon clarity because things have never been so uncertain on the regulative, the future of the regulatory framework than in those periods, because there are rumors in all directions and so on. So I think that everybody knows that we have taken a kind of balanced position. And before I would like to reassess and, and restate some, some very important points. Let me start with the first one, with the objectives of the digital decade. And I want to mention three of the objectives. The first one is connectivity, to put a VHC and everywhere and to have all the populated areas covered by 5G. That's, in fact, the main task of our members, and they are actively busy with that, uh, with some of our members investing at investment rates of 30% uh, of, of, of their sales. That's the first one. The second one that is also very important is, in fact, that we contribute to increase the skills of the people so that we have more people that are skilled. And I would add on that, that in fact, combined with the two first, and it's what in fact uh, the European Electronic Code had foreseen in its additional, uh, in fact, uh, objective of connectivity is uh, in fact the take up. And the take up brings us to affordability and bring us to inclusiveness. So there is a big issue today of inclusiveness and as companies eh, and all the other sector of the economy uh, digitalize more and more and even public services, we see the digital divide growing. Okay. Every day almost there are articles of people that feel excluded that cannot fill in their basic task as citizens. So that's an important one. And the other that is also very important is the green transition. Okay. So only if you look at those three major objectives, I think it's the responsibility of all the actors in the value chain to contribute to achieve those objectives. Okay. And then we should not discuss and, 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 and use lobby words say, uh, about what is a tax, what is not a tax, what is a contribution, and so on. At the end, companies have to contribute to the welfare and to the functioning of the society. As citizens, we do. And so at the end, what is important is that we achieve a well-functioning and a well-digitized, inclusive digital society in the EU. That's, in fact, the ultimate target. And for what we are uh, very active. Now, to reach there, hey, Tony, you mentioned it, uh, there is a very important tool, which is the European Electronic Communication Code, eh, which, uh, in fact, has adapted uh, the regulatory framework. But the regulatory framework that still consider those that have special power, have special responsibilities. And where we think in all these discussions, we have to stop to put all, uh, to mix everything together. So the regulatory framework and the European model, the area of framework based on access, based on, on, on other kind of, of, of regulation on the open internet and so on, has absolutely delivered on welfare. And for those that are not convinced yet, eh, I just uh, recommend you to rewatch the, uh, the recording of the event that was hosted by Executive Vice President Mark Vestager, eh, uh, making markets work for people. Eh, and the uh, uh, in fact, the results of the Eurobarometer. So this model absolutely needs to be preserved. Okay? So that's that's a very important one. It's also important to, to not mix all other kind of initiative. And in French, we say, the, le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, which means that the better is the enemy of the good. So when we come to the revision, for example, of the broadband cost reduction directive, that is a specific piece to reduce cost, and we should not mix anything with that. We should go on with that better yesterday than tomorrow. We are already very late. So that's also very important to go. And then to come back to, and, and after that, I will stop for the moment, to come back to the, uh, uh, in fact, to the, to the green transition, uh, we see that operators are all engaged in very important efforts to reduce the carbon footprint. 
they are also a, uh, a lot of hope that is placed on them to allow other sectors of the economy to greed to green their activity. Unfortunately, what we see is that, fortunately or unfortunately, to say in the terms of kind of carbon footprint, it's unfortunate. We see that there is massive or, or, or continuous increase in data traffic. I think that would be uh, factual. And uh, on that, this has an impact, a global impact on the carbon footprint. And I think there, we believe that it's a responsibility of all the actors uh, to engage in energy sobriety. And in fact, we believe that it would certainly help to refrain from engaging in actions that would in fact stimulate traffic that is not necessary. Eh? For example, to give you Ali, one specific example, why would you stream a video in high, in high, def high definition uh, to a smartphone where small definition or simple definition would, would, would suffice and so on. Well, so I will uh, stop my uh, first introduction uh, here, uh, Tony. Sorry, thanks, Luke. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I mean, one of the things which we discussed in the lecture prior to this was the question of whether, you know, market failures and, you know, too little being produced at too high a price, which is the standard monopoly problem, but also too much being produced at too low a price, which is uh, uh, the corollary, you know, so if you've negative externalities, uh, that can be an issue. So I'm not, but I'm not sure that's necessarily what's driving the discussion. Anyway, I'm going to pass over now to Johan. Yeah. Uh, be I, ca I can come back to that after it. Uh, really you can, yes, later. Okay, thanks, Luke. Johan. Thanks, Tony. <clears throat> and hello, everybody. Um, I will try to add um, a perspective from an economic point of view mainly right now as Tony kindly said in his introduction I did a couple of uh, things in the past I've been a regulator for many years in ACM uh, and Barrick I was involved in uh, the earlier IP interconnect and uh, net neutrality studies so I know that from close hand um, the dynamics behind that um, then I left uh, to work at Facebook Meta for a couple of years also in the area of connectivity um, and after that I joined Oxera, which I'm doing now as a senior advisor. That's my title, Tony. Uh, the titles don't matter, right? Um, so um, I will focus a little bit uh, on um, what Marit was referring to and what's now being broadly discussed in the OTT telco domain. And I try to avoid the term FS a little bit by talking just about uh, OTT contribution to stay a little bit neutral in the discussion. Um, but I think that there's a lot to be said about it, even though, uh, and I think Tony, you said something about it, there's no proposal yet, right? So process-wise, and Luke commented on this already, process-wise, I don't think it's, it's a very good way to speak about these kind of important uh, subjects. But uh, of course, I'm not blaming Edno because Edno should um, be clear whatever they want, right? And uh, bring all the arguments forward and all the studies they feel are important. And I think it's uh, it's very important to get uh, Edno's and the Telco's perspective in this debate. But I think from the European Co Commission, especially everybody would welcome a transparent process and a consultation document with all the pros and cons and uh, an open discussion. Maybe it will come, hopefully it will come, but um, uh, there are so many rumors these days that uh, people are a little bit concerned this not being the case. But uh, in the end, I expect this to be like uh, properly addressed because it's important. We are not talking about markets here which haven't been looked into over the last couple of years. I think uh, of all the markets in Europe almost, I would say there, uh, I don't think there are many markets where you have seen more regulators involved doing studies of the last couple of years. And I think to some extent even, you could say that uh, the current uh, responsibilities on the NRA still go into those markets, right? Of course, we're not talking about regulating transit peering markets anymore, but back in the days when I joined Opta, even just after the liberalization of the uh, of the market uh, of the markets in general, these markets were still regulated in some jurisdictions. So it's uh, people have investigated these markets. That said, I agree with Ma uh, with uh, Marit that um, technological developments could lead to new policy views and to new new dynamics, which 
ask for another way of looking at these markets and maybe new legislation. So uh, um, uh, it's it's right to talk about this and also to put it on the table to be discussed, especially now that we see that networks in the future will have much more capabilities also to be seen as a service potentially. So that dynamic must be acknowledged in the discussion and uh, we need rules in place which are future proof. That by way of intro, uh, I think, Therefore, it's also important to look at the internet as we know it to date and about what the internet could look like in the future. And uh, I think uh, for argument's sake, it's important to make the distinction because I think things get mixed a little bit. Uh, and uh, for instance, if you look at the Edno proposals and uh, the way Edno has spoken about it over the last couple of weeks, months, um, um, to me, it came across as that the six or seven, or I don't know how many largest OTTs in terms of generating traffic, and you can speak about whether they generate it or the consumers, of course, uh, I would say the consumers, but it's their services. So the six or seven largest OTTs traffic wise should contribute. But those OTTs are not necessarily the ones who will be the biggest or the most important one in the new networks, right? If you have like the networks as a service environment, uh, potentially some of those will be Present there might be powerful still, but not necessarily those six or seven that you see right now in terms of traffic. And those that are generating the most traffic right now are mostly streaming services and the other popular social media apps, et cetera. So that, that's one thing. I think also if you look at the here and now of the internet, you could argue whether the internet is not suited already for the growth that Mara just described. I think to a large extent, this is already the case. And that we have seen, if you look at the way the, uh, the telcos market their products and also offer bundles, et cetera, uh, the way uh, the networks uh, stayed strong during the, the, the pandemic. And also, if you look at the peak moments, which is like the relevant factor here, of course, to look at during certain uh, events, uh, the networks were able to deal with this. So that's an important thing too. That said, if you look at it from an economic perspective and look at the internet as a two-sided market, you can think of arguments where it would be better in terms of welfare, consumer outcome, if the other side of the market pays. That's economic theory has lots of examples where a two-sided market leads to better outcomes. So it could be, it's always good to reassess that in this particular instance too, right? Um, we haven't done that yet. We are working uh, on, a, on, a, on a bit of a piece for a neutral client in this space. Uh, so there will be something in the next couple of weeks, months, probably from our end. Um, but I can tell you a little bit where you then, if you were to make such an assessment, need to look at, right? Because you can charge a couple of OTTs. Uh, I don't think you can charge all OTTs because then you will basically be charging the whole internet, which is not feasible, I would say, right? So you need always need to work with some kind of threshold, which in itself creates all kinds of side effects, yeah? uh, because where to put that threshold, what happens to those OTTs which are just in and just out, right? So that, and that triggers immediately a lot of competition related questions on that end. But imagine if you have like a, a bucket where you can justify that those would be in, then the Question would also be if you were to charge them, what that would mean for broadband prices in the end, right? Because the only positive effect for the overall economy would be if there would be some kind of pass through to the consumer side. And that would lead to more data usage or more consumer pickup, right? That's the, the mechanics. Um, um, of course, I can't do the calculations here, but of course, uh, things have been done in the past a little bit in this regard. Again, I'm speaking about the here and now economics of the internet as it is, right? With the, the current services as we know them, not about the, the, fu uh, the future networks where dynamics could be different. I'm not convinced yet, but it could be, right? Um, but then those calculations, and those are the typical calculations, which you would otherwise also make in market reviews, right? Or in other things that the current NRAs need to take into account when to regulate telcos, for instance. So I think also here, before you do or recommend such a strong intervention, you should have some kind of justification why that would lead to better outcomes, right? Um, but those are the mechanisms. There's a relationship between what the caps pay and then what happens on the retail side of the broadband connection, right? It should lead to some kind of discount. Then you also need to look at what it means for uh, caps or for OTTs, right? Because they need to pay. So there will some, be some effect on their end too. And this will not 
always be immediately a price because some don't have a pricing mechanism if you are advertisement based some do like netflix uh, so the differences might be different but you need to take it into account if you were to assess what such a regime change would be um that's something which you can't do overnight right so i think this is typical something where you need to be very careful and um uh, i read the reports that have been published about uh from acom and um I think even if you look at the calculations in there with uh, uh, with the traffic sensitive costs, which are guessed, guessed there, uh, I don't think they are validated and you can have a large discussion um, uh, about whether this is like um, realistic. But I think even with those calculations, the, the net effect would be limited in terms of welfare. And then you would create a lot of issues, like I said, on the OTT side, the distortion of competition potentially, but also, and there uh, I will pause after this one, you will have the need of a regulator. We all know that these kind of markets need a regulator. You're basically talking about the same dynamics, and Tony, you worked a lot in this area, uh, as terminate, terminating markets. So you need to have a regulator who's closely involved in this and basically probably set the price if this were to work. And um, you've got so many complexity added to that role. Uh, traffic monitoring, setting the right price, diving in the cost, which is so complicated. And if the net effect for the consumers is so limited, if positive at all, and then I think in the current stage of the internet, this is not a very, I'm not convinced yet. Let, let me phrase it this way. If you look at the internet of the future, dynamics might change, like I said, right? I don't know the answer yet, but I think if Ethno or the telcos want to make the claim that once the networks evolve to some other a capability where the dynamics might be different i think that should be separated from the other discussion and then you should have a discussion about those capabilities my yeah. guess would be also having been on the meta side for a couple of years that in that kind of a environment it would also be more like a collaborative approach between the different players on the on the ott side and the telcos uh, and i'm also not convinced that that would not lead to outcomes that would be like symbiotic like the relationship in general is between the OTTs and telcos. I mean, it's, uh, thanks, Jan. I mean, it's one of the things that struck me, which we discussed on the course. Sorry, I, you'll have to forgive me because every now and again, I sort of I'm talking back to the students that we spoke to previously. But one of the things uh, which came up is that networks don't stay static. It never ends. It's a constant uh, flow of investment and upgrade and technology and innovation. So, I mean, people talk about, you know, metaverse being 40 times HD stream or whatever. You know, if you go back 10 years or 12 years, you know, and think about what our internet usage looked like or what our connectivity was like, it's radically different from what it is today. So I'm not sure, I understand there are big changes coming, but I'm not so sure that they haven't already been provisioned. Anyway, uh, Pierre Luigi, I'm very interested to hear uh, what you have to say. I mean, I think that's very interesting about two-sided markets. I mean, there, there's a question for me about whether these can be described as two-sided markets, because I'm not sure that the part in the middle can arbitrate between the two. But but anyway, sorry, the question remains, you know, is there a need for investment from our finance? This is the question from OTT to Telco. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Tony, uh, first, uh, some advertising, okay? Uh, I'm the director right now of the Center for the Digital Society. That means we have merged the Florence School of Regulation, Communications and Media, and the Florence Competition Program, and now we deal in general with the digital society, working on four areas, regulation, competition, innovation, and digital democracy. So. This is where do we stand as a, an idea of these issues. Uh, okay, uh, this discussion about uh, uh, telcos uh, asking big tech to pay uh, uh, more of the network uh, building, we had it already 15 years ago and didn't bring us too far because uh, uh, Somehow we concluded, I think, that uh, 
I'm not saying that I concluded, we concluded that, that they were paying their, their part, it wasn't unclear what they should pay more. This was 15 years ago. If you remember 15 years ago, the other team was uh, telcos are regulated while big techs can do, other OTT can do whatever they want because they are not regulated. There is no level playing fields. And these two, these two issues were kind of parallel the issue of pain and the issue of regulation. Uh, however, uh, I may be wrong, but uh, let me say that the feeling of the, in which it was concluded, the discussion was, uh, well, in the end, OTT have devised a business model to make a lot of money. And that is kind of expropriating telcos of something. But the way in which to really get this money back wasn't found at the time. Then to this discussion, somehow this discussion was left alone for a while, that's my feeling. And another discussion came and was a discussion that came mainly from states and was this discussion at the, the European Union, digital targets. Now we have the last ones in the digital compass. But anyway, these targets about connectivity, we need a lot of connectivity, we need it quickly and so on. And also this discussion, I have to say, on this, well, on the first, I'm, we didn't play much of a role. On the second, we played more of a role as a Florence School of Regulation, trying to say careful on these targets, because targets, if you are the public, if you are the state, and you put, if you are the European Union and you put a target, then the question is, of this target, you put the money behind the target, and then it's a story or you are simply trying to uh, nudge operators to do things that they may not want to do at that very moment. Probably they think that the demand is not ready, there is will, not willingness to pay, that what they can provide is already okay. Why should you force, unless you have very good reasons, very good that proved externalities to push, but then if you have externalities, put the money if you are the, the public, you know? So this was the second discussion. Now, somehow, all this discussion went, uh, we had uh, now the targets, we are back here. Uh, the, a piece of the previous discussion, the piece that there is no more regulation of the big tech is not totally true anymore, because now we have some kind of a new regulation in Europe of the big tech. So that element of level playing field is less clear. We'll see how the DMA, the DSA, all this will work but we have some more regulation also on the other side. And now the question is, comes back to the question, are they paying the fair share? That's the question. Uh, when I see, as an economist, okay, uh, when I hear fairness and fair in this kind of discussion, I'm a bit uh, uncertain, as you can understand, not because I'm for fairness, obviously, but it's a, a, a philosophical dimension. Then let me break this into things. There are two questions here. One question is redistribution. Fairness is an issue of redistribution. We want to distribute money from big tech to telcos. Or fairness is a question of efficiency. We want more efficient network. We want more money quickly in the networks because we want to reach those targets. And this is a serious question that we have to ask because that's the, the way in which you should uh, be, able, be able to ask uh, the question of fairness. And uh, let me quickly start with a parallel, because we have another area in which we have a discussion that is very similar. I don't know how you are following it, is the media, okay? In the media, we have more or less the same story. The media have lost many of their sources of financing, they don't, uh, uh, news have been devalued by the uh, social media in which news go almost for free. Advertising has moved to advertising online. So uh, traditional sources of advertising for, me, for legacy media are not there. And so they are in extreme economic difficulties. Then uh, somehow we arrive to the idea, well, this is unfair. Media should get some money from the big tech uh, the copyright directive moves in somehow in this, direct, in this direction, but it's not only Europe. And on this, we have Australia, Canada. There are many movements all around the world trying to say, 
the big tech should contribute to media, okay? But there is a question of fairness, sorry, is a question of redistribution or is a question of, product, of efficiency of production? There, in my opinion at least, seems to be really a question more clear of existence of production. Because if you, if you think that media can produce more quality information than the, the mess of the social media in general, then you need somehow to finance this quality information, this professional information. So somehow you are posing a question of fairness, but you are saying there is a reason, and the reason is if not, we won't have any more quality information. So I think the telcos should uh, somehow also face this discussion. Are we posing a question of uh, investment in sense that we have to, we need this money to have more efficient network to really develop the networks? Because if not, we don't have the networks that we need. Or is a question of distribution? Is it, uh, let me be very honest, it's a question mark. I see the parallel with the media, but in the media I see the disaster. Uh, the risk of disaster. Here, uh, I see a lot of economic problems for the telcos in these 10, 15 years, but I don't know where is the point. And then there is a second point that I want to underline quickly, is public money, okay? In the media, when you discuss media, when you are talking about uh, uh, public service media, the te public televisions and so on, they are not generally asking money from the telcos, uh, from the, sorry, from the big techs because they know they have public money, okay? So it's not those media that we are discussing, it's all the rest, that, however, are the most important, a lot of media. Eh? Uh, here, there is the question of public money in the networks. When we had the discussion 15 years, 15 years ago, the networks were essentially legacy networks built in monopolistic situation, then unbundled, so on, all these things but they were legacy networks. Now there is the question, we have to make the new investments. We have to make the new networks. That's the reason why it's a different ballpark and, and why I think it's, it's reasonable to discuss the issue. But then there is a question, how much public money is getting into these networks, in Europe in particular? We have to discuss also this. And how contradiction, contradictory is, for instance, let's think to 5G. Let's think to mobile. What is the contradiction between financing 5G, financing mobile because we need very good, and, and that's tra really traffic sensitive mobile, by the way. Eh? We need more network, mobile network quickly. In the meantime, we have auctions in which the states get a lot of money out of the, the telcos, the, the mobile. You see, we are in, in a kind of a mix of many contradictions in this very moment. I, I cannot give you an yeah. answer to this, and I'm stopping here. Let me yeah. say that uh, all these things need the really to be topics of the consultation. We need to have a, a deep discussion. And finally, let me say, and I'm, I can be a bit iconoclast here, I think in the discussion we should put also net neutrality because the kind of net neutrality that we have around is not a net neutrality that helps to evolve. Particularly in mobile, in 5G and in the future, with all virtual record, all, all these things, the kind of net neutrality that we have at the moment in Europe probably doesn't allow the evolution of network in the right way. So I think all these topics should be really discussed together in the consultation. That's my view. Sorry, I I think that's a great intervention. I mean, what strikes me, just if I may, is that, you know, if I look at the code, you know, we have in Europe the system whereby we rely on markets to do the heavy lifting and a competitive process, you know, and a market dynamic that delivers for the, the masses, as it were. And then in the event that there is a failure to deliver for some portion of the market, then, you know, you might get some sort of state aid intervention. And, I, and we have this process of universal service, obviously under the code. One of the things, you know, so in, when the commission put forward in 2016, the code, they said, look, we're gonna more or less get rid of universal service. 
because we can see that telecom networks, the benefits accrue to society and that it should be paid for from, if, where there has to be an intervention, it should be paid from, from general taxation. And so there is actually, it hasn't really come up in the debate, but obviously Article 92 of the code, uh, more or less, I mean, there'd be open, I'm sure there are lawyers here, there are a lot of economists on this panel, but you know, Article 92 kind of prohibits uh, a tax on any firms to pay for special projects. So I actually wonder if that's not or should not be a consideration in the current debate. But but anyway, it's uh, sorry, I thought you, you raised a number of very interesting points there. I mean, something that strikes me, I'm sorry, you're going to notice that I pose a number of questions to Marit, and I should have said at the start, Marit has to leave at five o'clock, um, but she'll be replaced by her colleague Alessandro at a certain moment. And so, so you may see me asking her more questions, but I'm gonna ask Marit and I'm gonna ask Luke at the same time. Like, it's a question, are your members, are there instances where your members are not able to raise finance for projects? You know what I mean? So is the problem that there is money to invest in networks? Because as far as I can see, networks are rolling out very quickly in Europe. I mean, particularly, um, particularly since the code has been adopted, uh, we see a lot of money flooding into the market from different sectors. I mean, do you see a, a problem? Do you see a, a gap in financing? Luke or Mar Listen, uh, Mar I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to yeah. jump in. Thanks, Tony. Um, so, of course, I mean. Uh, <clears throat> There is a lot of investment ongoing. Anybody in your own country will have seen that probably you have fiber being deployed. Uh, 5G is becoming more frequent in mid-sized towns all over all over different countries. So there is a lot of um, investment going. This is aided by new business models, of course. There is public funding in some countries. I mean, we have you know little policy tools here and there that are of course supportive of this, but mostly this is still driven by private investment. Uh, to the extent possible, but we do see, um, I do see a couple of issues with the investment, and this also goes goes to the previous points of, I think it was Professor Parku who talked about the specificity of networks and how, how you know, where is re the real need for networks to be um, for the investment. So one is clearly the, the coverage, and we already mentioned the Digital Decade 2030 goals, they are very ambitious. We are fully committed to them as, as ETNO, but to have pretty much ubiquitous fiber and 5G across Europe in 2030, it's a very, very, very ambitious task. So it is about the coverage. Then you have the, you know, the second layer, which is more about the existing network and the fact that there is, because of the data traffic volumes, a continuous need to redimension the networks, the existing networks, to cope with the traffic, that is also a cost for the for the telecom operators. But it's really more than a question of quality to make sure that your customers in even urban areas have good quality communications and they're receiving the different services and apps in a good quality manner. And then you have the financial, you have the third point about financial sustainability. So really the return on investment and yes, about the fairness as well, because we are seeing that the markets, whether it's connectivity and cloud, the markets are getting very mixed up actually. So we have different stakeholders entering into these different markets and it is not so clear anymore, you know, who is the connectivity service provider and, and who is the cloud service provider, for example, we have now some of the large uh, technology companies uh, piloting connectivity solutions based on edge cloud, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi based or WAN based, et cetera, et cetera. So starting to provide connectivity from different bases. These are, um, of course, we, you know, we have to welcome innovation. We're not going to start uh, standing uh, in the way of innovation or new technology, but we need to ask ourselves the question that, well, you know, what do we want as Europe? Do we want to have a set of good networks that you know are good quality and yes have the coverage needed for the full population and i even would go here to the extent that connectivity networks these days they are pretty fundamental to citizens i mean 
You can argue in some countries, and I come from Finland, that some public services tend to be now only available on the internet. So if you're living in some rural area, I mean, it is pretty much your democratic right to have access to good quality connectivity because otherwise you might not be served uh, you know, well in terms of even public services. So I think there are some you know, questions there that are pretty fundamental. And maybe one thing to, to Johan's point about the, the fact that networks were coping fine during COVID times, et cetera, I do get a little bit allergic about when people talk about the kind of the myth of the internet and, and internet is self-regulating, self-adapting, et cetera, et cetera, because I believe, I mean, we of course at Edno believe in the open internet and, and the protocols and all the standards, but the internet is a network of networks, autonomous networks, and these networks do not just self-adapt or self you know, uh, kind of, you know, regulate themselves when there is more traffic. No, that is then for the network owner and manager to take a decision to invest in order to expand or redimension or I don't know what, at capacity. So, so yes, you know, internet is the kind of the, 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 the global model, if you like, and it's, of course, a model that we want to uh, maintain, but then the network operators do have a very specific role here to invest. And I think that that's just not often, you know, it doesn't come clear enough in, in some of these discussions. So, so yeah, those were my top of mind and just a very important point on the processes. So we, of course, also at Edno, yes, you can say we, you know, of course had our reports, et cetera, but we are very much supporting the transparent process in this. And of course, also when we talk about the, scope of any potential policy initiative we're currently talking about you know five six big players that are currently you know topping the data charge if you like but in the end of course any criteria should be objective and and you know we are not saying that this should be name tag to specific companies who happen to be you know leading the market at the moment so so those are of course kind of you know things that we do take for granted Sorry, thank you. Uh, Look, I mean, in fact, maybe I'll phrase it a little bit just to lead on to what Marish was saying. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I saw Rudolf van der Berg pose a question in the chat about whether, uh, you know, there's actually a problem, whether, you know, this, what's the difficulty in dealing with and having uh, an increase in traffic, you know, can't they deal with it? And I suppose my, sort of coming from Marit's observations. I mean, to some extent, aren't, haven't or have telco operators anticipated the growing traffic? Haven't they built and provisioned their networks to deal with, you know, traffic that they perceive over the next three years or five years? I mean, it's not, and I know, I understand we're going from, you know, from today's usage to much higher usage in the future, but, that's we're on a continuum, maybe driven by the metaverse. You know, in the past, but, it was t t t something t t else. T Tony, uh, but allow me to to make some other yeah, comments please. as well, because yeah. many many things have uh, have been said, and and I saw Rudolf's question that I'm sure that Rudolf will make a a comprehensive uh, contribution to the to the open consultation because uh, uh, so on, on that uh, I'm sure of that, uh, and I'm sure that the commission will welcome it. So uh, what I wanted to say, uh, let me make a couple of steps steps back. It's first, as I introduced, there are many objectives that have been put. And, and as what said by the Professor uh, Parku, setting objective is in fact, yeah, it's, it's, you can imagine if you do not put the medium or the money behind, it, 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 it might be kind of useless was a little bit the message. But I would tend to totally disagree with that because what is important is for Europe to set a direction and to show where we want to go, you see? Because that's a signal, that's a signal to all the sector of the economy, to the investors and so on, that this is actually objective and a direction we want to go. And at the end, it's it's quite really important. It's a little bit, that's a, maybe a dangerous comparison, but. Uh, why, like the Pope would say something, and of course he say he says a high level vision or high level target, and 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 of course uh, people tend to to go to that or, or or not. 
But you see, and that's the point. At the end, if you would not set your direction, the probability that you achieve those results would be zero or almost zero. But when you set the direction, you know that the forces will drive to that direction. And that's quite of important. And when it comes to fixed network, eh, there are directions that have been set, that is targets, and there is no obligation for the operators. If the operators would not invest and not reach that investment, that is, yeah, they will not be punished for that. Eh? That's one. On the second point on 5G, that's a little bit more complex because they are, uh, in fact, uh, targets that are cover coverage targets that are fixed with the license conditions. And Professor Park who explained there is a big paradox here is that on the one hand, we want a lot to be done by the operators. And on the other hand, we are in some countries are asking high frequencies fees. So any euro that you put in the frequencies, you do not put them in the network. And in the other hand, we tend to forget the role of competition in all those stories. And that's quite important. So and then we would say, okay, but, and you mentioned in it, uh, Tony, that we could put stated on it. So the stated guidelines have been revised. Eh? Moreover, the operators have not said, please give us billions of, of euro and we will uh, invest it. It's not what they said. They said in areas where we'll commercially deploy, stay out of it, of, of stated. And here I have a very important reflection because what we also see is that stock markets in history have never been a, eh, I have never showed an appetite for long-term investment. And we are now in a phase of long-term investment in fiber, in 5G, and so on. So stock markets it might be, we might question if the stock market is the right place to be to invest in those networks. And the reason, I mean, the, the solution for, to push stock market operators that are on the stock market to more invest is to certainly maintain sufficiently competition. Because when there is competition, you have to protect your cash flows. And by protecting your cash flows eh, at the expected rate of return, you, uh, in fact, uh, create value for uh, for your shareholder. So that's very, that's the kind of thing that is uh that is also uh, uh, very, very important. On the other hand, if you would compare on that uh, France and Germany, we see France that is quite uh, a competitive country with four fully integrated fixed mobile operators, uh, where we see the investment are going uh, greater year after year with, with good coverage on, on, on mobile and, and, and good coverage on FTTH. And we would compare that to Germany, where, of course, there we see lots kind of ball of new players uh, investing a lot in fiber, but lacking a lot beyond in terms of mobile and not lacking a lot to, behind in terms of uh, FTTH. And there we would then say, but okay, but that let's put a lot of state money. But then we would think, but it is this fair in terms of internal market because, yeah, the country with the deepest pocket and that has done a, a, a not so good implementation of the regulatory framework would then solve this problem by putting a lot of money on the table and then favoring the biggest, the biggest players, which we would think is this fair. I would disagree with that. But now let's come uh, a little bit more to uh, the question of the traffic and, and all this involved. I, I have to say that that's why it's important to remain on the facts. And I'm sure through the consultation, through all the, the process that absolutely need to be open, transparent, with involvement, but all, all, all stakeholders with public consultation, with room for debate, which is not always the case. Eh? The example of the review of the access recommendation is in fact a shame for the European Commission on the way they do it. Uh, but it and co coming to that, it's it's in fact, let's look at it in different way. Eh? Because as we said, and as I said before, when the pandemic was there, the operators have filled their role. They manage the traffic. Eh? They not only manage the traffic, eh? at a period where there was a shortage in, uh, in fact, in uh, protection equipment, masks and so on, eh? They continue to send their technicians, even in full lockdown, to build uh, new antennas and new uh, to increase the coverage on 4G and start it on 5G, to continue to build FTTH, to make sure that as much as possible people will be connected uh, to the digital society. So there, the operators have, have fulfilled a very fundamental role for which I think they deserve a big applause too. But now when it comes to, uh, yes, uh, Tony, I will now finalize my point on, on the data. Uh, all this has an impact uh, in fact on the uh, on, 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 on in fact on the carbon impact as I said. And whatever if they can cope or not, that's certainly a fundamental question that are what the costs behind it. My view is that 
why would we push or continue to push to more data if it's not needed, as I said previously? And allow me to say two more things. This is the study made by, I hope you see it, by, uh, in fact, the uh, the, the Digitalization uh, for Sustainability uh, group, which is a group of scientists that has made a study. And what, what do they say about this? And allow me to read it, is that consequently, the core business of multi-site platform is to constantly develop techniques that stimulate user engagement and increase digital service affluence. Autoplay, constant scrolling, embedded videos, ads, spots up, trap nails, removal of starts and credit in series episode, automatic preview of video before they start, automatic refresh, etc., etc. I will not read everything. Mm -hmm. And so, and this resulted in tremendous growth rate between 2015 and 2020 in their revenue and their energy demands. And then Tony, allow me to, to, to close with, with a uh, my last point on that is that would you say, but does it matter? Does it make the difference? And allow me here to read quickly the poem of, of the legend that Pierre Rabhi uh, often uh, present okay. is Are the legend please? of the hummingbird. Eh? And one day, a long time ago, and in a faraway place or so, the legend goes, there was a huge forest fire that was uh, raging the countryside. All the animals were terrified running around the circles, tree, screaming, crying, and helplessly watching the impeding disaster. But in the middle of the flames and above the co covering animals was a tiny hummingbird busy flying from a small pond to the fire, each time fetching a few drops with its back to throw on the flames, and then again and again and again. After a while, an old grouchy armadillo annoyed by this ridiculous useless agitation on the part of the hummingbird cried out, Tiny bird, don't be a fool. It's not with those minuscule drops of water one after the other that you are going to put out the fire and sail all of us. To which the mummy bird replied, could be, but I'm doing my bit. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Luke. Sorry, uh, we. I'm struck there by a couple of things. I want to come back to Johan, uh, if I may. Uh, not just on the two-sided part, but what strikes me is actually almost a broader question, and it leads on from something that Mark was discussing, which is, you know, that, uh, you know, in terms of returns on investment, we see different types of investors coming in who have a structurally lower cost of capital. And I think uh, that may be a question a long-term question for uh, integrated telecom operators. Maybe that's a model, you know, that's not going to survive or can't coexist, particularly when it happens at scale, uh, as in Italy. Um, and the other thing that struck me uh, listening to Marit and to Luke less is that, you know, to some extent, we have a lot of things, a lot of network is already built. You look at Italy, we're due to hit 100%, you know, 2027 or 2028. Now there's a lot of public finance in there, but a lot of European countries, well before 2030, are going to hit 100% of fixed coverage in their networks. They have plans to hit it, you know. Um, and I'm just wondering, are we looking at the right question? Is the, is the right question something else? Is it about, you know, say some of the, the questions about the cloud and intel network intelligence moving to the cloud. Are we, like we're zoned in on this thing. I'm just, sorry, my question to you on is, are we looking at the right thing or should we be looking more broadly? It's a good question, Tony. And I didn't prepare a poem, by the way. So uh, yeah. <laughs> apologies for okay. that. But I think the que it's not clear what we're looking at because uh, I think process-wise, we don't know exactly what the problem is that we're discussing. Of course, we know from Edna Marit, it's about investments. And then there's the follow-up suggestion how that could be tackled with, right? And from there, it becomes a little bit blurry in my view, where the, where you see like the here and now and the future gets mixed with like politic political goals that could be achieved right now because of the uh, uh, the political climate being more receptive to it, rather than going into the substance of the discussion, which I think you, Tony, are exactly pointing to because I agree, I agree with you um you first need to identify a problem 
if there's a problem, right? Given the state of the networks right now and the capability to deal with uh, whatever traffic is already going over it and uh, the growth that should come. And of course, uh, like Marek just said, I think Alessandro just joined to replace her, but so he can comment later, maybe. Uh, like Mare just said, uh, that comes with investments from Telcos, uh, and I'm not downplaying it. I've been in those discussions during uh, the pandemic, actually, on Meta's side, together with the Telcos and the European institutions to see how we can make those networks work, right? So, and Meta and the other uh, big streamers, so to say, they cut down for uh, a period uh, the video, um, uh, resolution, right, to 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 be better able to deal with it. So I would never downplay that. But I think the question right now is that I think that the current networks can cope with the current traffic. And I think the relative investments to deal with, like, the stable growth, given the services that we know to date, is not that challenging. And there you can talk about fairness, and I like that part in Pierre Luigi's inter in, in, in interruption, hey, you can talk about fairness, whether it's fair that the consumers, because the consumers pay for that subscription, right? We, we shouldn't talk as if the telcos can't recover their costs, right? It's it's this, the, 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 the consumers pay for this. But you can talk about fairness, whether they should pay for a part, and then the OTT should pay an additional part. But I think that's the discussion about fairness, transferring money more than about economic gains, like I said in my first uh, interruption. But then the other question, uh, Tony, is what's the problem of the future? I don't know yet if there is a problem. Is there an investment problem to deal with the, uh, the targets by the European uh, Commission? Is there a problem to deal with the services of the future, whether it's metaverse or whatever kind of fancy service we all anticipate? I'm not convinced whether there's a problem there. Of course, for those kind of services, AR, VR, you need investments, right? But I think it's a different dynamic. It's also an area where you, and, and put it on my competition head, where you basically need to compete in that space with the air internet as we know it. Because we don't know how the consumer or the business pickup will be in that environment, right? And that's a risk not only by the telcos, if they were to invest in there, but definitely also by the OTTs. That's a combined risk, right? Meta puts a lot of money in the, into the metaverse. And um, I'm not so convinced whether the shareholders are like uh, completely happy about it, for instance, right? And it's this is like a dynamic, which is Meta's dynamic. It's not, a, of course, it's related to the telcos business case, but it's, it's again, it's a symbiotic nature, right? I think there will be a symbiotic um, relationship and uh, potential gain for both the network players, network operators, and the OTTs in a new environment. But it's not guaranteed it will be as profitable as it is maybe in some other areas, right? So it's like a, it's a business risk that everybody needs to take. And I can see that maybe some regulation needs to be changed or adopted in that environment. And I think that some, like Ofcom, opened up the debate a little bit in the net neutrality domain, uh, even though they are restricted by the current rules still. But I think they try to take a little bit more liberal view to make use of those use cases to see whether there should be a little bit more flexibility, et cetera. I think that spirit in itself, I appreciate, right? You look at the market, you see whether there needs to be some flexibility, but then to move to some kind of contribution from the OTTs without thinking it through, without justifying it, I don't see it. If you feel like it's not fair that OTTs make profit Okay, I think it's a separate discussion where you, it's more like tax related almost. Um, um, but it's not per se to be used in this environment and definitely not as a sort of traffic tax, right? And I think that's the last remark. Traffic is different from profit, right? We've got the DMA coming up. So the DMA is supposed to deal a little bit with the, the market power of uh, big OTTs, not necessarily the ones who are the biggest in terms of traffic though, but there will be some overlap. Um, uh, because my question would also be to Edno, uh, apparently there's the assumption that their profits of the OTTs will continue for years or something because they need to contribute, right? But what would happen if they don't make a profit? They still generate traffic, but they won't make profit anymore because of DMA effects or something else, right? Competition. Then how would the mechanism work then? Do they still need to contribute even though they are loss making? I think that's the wrong connection, right? Traffic shouldn't be connected directly to profit. It's a different mechanism. Yeah, I think that's a good observation. The other thing that strikes me as well, in fact, is just in terms of 
concentration. I'm not sure that it comes from the fact that it comes from, say, Netflix, for instance. If Netflix was atomized into 50 different streamers, I'm not sure that that would make any difference. You know what I mean? So the fact that it's one rather than 50, I'm not sure that it does. Pure Luigi, sorry, I'm trying to get a bit of balance in the in the flow. Um, but uh, Pierre Luigi, if I can just ask you, um, sorry, there's a question that came in on the chat here, and it's basically saying, you know, ISPs don't charge. It's not. They're basically saying there isn't market power on the interconnect, the IS, the IP interconnect market. That you know, it doesn't matter whether you're big or small. It's the exact same pricing and, and traffic flows for you. Would you? Would you see that as a good indicator or or how would you view it? Sorry, you're still on mute, Pierre. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Uh, first, let me start again with some advertising, okay? Uh, the 14th, so next week we'll do a, an hybrid uh, uh, conference is too much. It's more of a, of a brainstorming on metaverse in which we'll present a couple of papers on the economics and the legal issues. And then we'll discuss uh, the research topics. Some of the things we are discussing today clearly are uh, connected, traffic and uh, internet 3.0 and so on. So, if you are interested, is in our website. Uh, well, let me first answer on something. Uh, I heard this idea uh, that is the moment for Telco to be uh, to recognize and to get to recognize their uh, dimension of a two-sided market. Okay, uh, I think this is a double sword thing. That is not such. A, I mean, you can always say that anybody is a two-sided market, and uh, that's most, most of the time true. But remember that the two-sided markets are, are built also on the idea that sometimes one side pays and another doesn't. So it could be no solution of the issue, okay? That's just the signal I wanted to, to send to my friends. I'm old fr an old friend of the telcos, obviously. So let's send this signal. Uh, then. Uh, Issues of, uh, of uh, uh, this uh, present network can cope with traffic. To come back to the issue of, uh, uh, of the targets, okay? I don't think that wrong targets are, um, are uh, as I can say, innocuous. I think wrong targets are a problem. So, you can have an idea. You want Europe, the digital compass. You want Europe one gigabyte at every book, okay? Can be an idea if it's true, if it's right, if you have the externality why you need this. I'm not, say, I'm not discussing now the present targets. I'm discussing the targets of 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. Somehow somebody put targets to these telcos on uh, uh, fiber when they weren't ready. They were going to FTTC. And they were asked, no, we need the FTTH. But there was no willingness to pay. There was no reason for that in many countries. And that probably slowed down telcos. I think that, at least in certain countries that I know, we had the situation of difficulties. Wrong targets, wrong public money used. Uh, and then often not even uh, simply bad use of the ideas. And, you, and you see what I think is the real mistake here. The mistake is politicians saying what companies should do without knowing exactly what needs to be done. That's the old mistake. Politicians choosing winners. I think net neutrality is an issue and we should discuss it seriously. But one thing that instead, something that is to be defended always is a neutral, a technological neutrality. Politicians shouldn't be choosing technologies. That's not their job. They don't know. And that's why I think we have messed up a little bit. Not too much. 
because in the end, telcos did what they could. And so they normally made their best choices. But it's a mistake to give to people, to companies indication, unless you put the money. Then if you put the money, the, the states put the money, then you maybe make a mistake, but at least it's a democracy mistake. You have, you have voted, you put your own money, you make a mistake, and then the next time they will vote against you if you have made a mistake. But to give targets, push people in the right, in the wrong direction is an issue. So that's why I say, always careful when technological neutrality is violated by choices made by somebody that doesn't have all the information. That's my, was my point today, are simply. Anyway, uh, coming back and closing on this, I think that this is a serious debate. Eh? Even fairness, I don't want to give the feeling that uh, I don't care. Eh? I care a lot. Only I want to distinguish between when we are discussing redistribution and there could be reasons. I, I explained for the media why I think could be important. There could be situations, a reason in which redistribution is important and when we are pursuing efficiency. And we need to have this discussion clear because this is the key. I mean, I think as any parent in this call will recognize the issue of fairness is uh, very subjective <laughs> in general. Um, sorry, I am... Um, uh, so Marit had to leave, Alessandro Grappelli has jumped in to replace her and he's chomping at the bit to, to react to some of the things that he's heard. So Alessandro, I, uh, please. Thanks a lot, Tony. And I'll be short, I followed a bit the uh, earlier part of the debate. Um, I find it very level-headed compared to the average fair share debate. So I'm really thankful. Uh, I, I hear a lot of, I'm learning a lot. Um, a couple of things. First, <clears throat> it, there seems to be a lot of, of wondering why are we having this debate? Is there even a problem? Is it just an exotic ethno idea th th that is coming back to haunt us? Uh, but I guess that the reason why we are having this debate um, is one on which hopefully we all agree, which is that there is a regulatory asymmetry, meaning that uh, in 2015, we decided uh, through a legitimate democratic legislative process to regulate one set of actors in the internet traffic markets and as far as uh, data traffic is concerned through net neutrality or the open internet regulation. Uh, we can argue whether it was right or it was wrong. Uh, Pierluigi just mentioned it, but also Johan referenced what Ofcom is doing. Point is that in Europe, we have a law that is now cemented into the acquis communautaire, also through subsequent European Court of Justice rulings. Um, as that, no, we have been explicit since minute one that we are not seeking to change the principle of that law. But what the, where does that bring us? It brings us to a regulatory asymmetry in which uh, uh, one part uh, of the market is regulated and the other isn't. So this is why we are having uh, this debate or one of the uh, reasons uh, why. Uh, the other two quick uh, reactions uh, were uh, one on the negotiating power question that relates then also to the fairness question, right? Because as Tony rightly says, fairness is a subjective uh, um, uh, concept. What isn't probably is uh, who has more market power and how that market power is exercised in the market. So we have competition practice to understand uh, those dynamics and uh, to detect whether there is abuse or something similar to abuse. So it's not the case that when we presented our view of, on, on this debate, we said that we fully recognize the presence of the DMA, but we believe that the DMA does not address the specific imbalances or what we perceive as imbalances inside this market, which is a specific market um, that, that is related uh, to data uh, traffic. Um, the uh, last thing that I also wanted to say is uh, a bit of our uh, of how our sector works. And, and uh, we are blessed with uh, frequent uh, discussions with analysts and investors. 
we are a sector that invests ahead of demand by, by definition. Uh, Lux members, our members, they're putting a lot of money on the table before they see <laughs> the return coming. It's a bit uh, the drill um, uh, in telcos. However, the, the fact that the financial sustainability um, is at a critical point is maybe also witnessed uh, but by some of the trends that uh, you were uh, rightfully discussing like uh, uh, shedding the network companies or the tower companies. Here, um, we have some members who are looking into that um, in Denmark, in Italy. Um, so uh, I think that where those markets are going is a rational place, is, is a place where they need to go if they want to go ahead with investment and so on. On the other hand, if we look at it from a purely financial market viewpoint, the main driver of that is that in order to create shareholder value, that's your option because you cannot grow otherwise <laughs> through innovation or through other things or, or through uh, other things that maybe are not considered desirable, like a consolidation and so on, or raising consumer prices. That's a thing that I'm hearing a lot. Huh? I'm hearing big tech in many debates saying, hey, why don't you raise the prices? I mean, that, that's a, a controversial question, right, to, to discuss. So uh, this then leads me to, to the last point, which is also, let's see how these new market and ownership structures will work in the long term. Which effect will they have on innovation, uh, on edge cloud, on 6G, on network virtualization? Uh, do they carry additional consequences? And are those consequences desirable from a public policy viewpoint or not? These are open questions, so. We are coming very close to the end. Um, you've raised some interesting questions there, uh, Sandro. I mean, I'm struck. It's a very broad issue. I would, because it's not simply about traffic exchange and so on. It does, extend into a lot of other areas. I'm just, I'm struck, there's a, a number of questions in the q and I don't know if the other panel, if the panelists have been looking at those. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple that are basically saying, look, you know, is this a double-edged sword? Are you going to push, uh, push OTT to, to move further down, to, to extend our CDNs into the capillary telecom network, if I can put it so crudely, and, you know, you'll find yourself um, in trouble. I mean, I am struck by the fact that there's no demand for broadband. You know, it's only for what you can use broadband to get. So there's a kind of a symbiotic relationship. I don't know if anybody wants to come in on that. I was thinking maybe, Johan, if you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'm looking at the questions and from Antonio. Good to hear from you, by the way. Yeah. And then there's somebody anonymous. anonymous and, more or less asking and, yeah. and David yeah. has an interesting one too. So I can... Maybe I'll so can just, I mean, Antonio's and uh, David's maybe, and then. Uh, so the question <laughs> is, would it yeah, be a solution if if OTT invested in network? Had, I, mean, low, in I think Antonio presents it at would would the effect of a levy be that they would invest more in networks, which would be not per se positive for uh, network operators? That's the way I read the uh, read the uh, the question. But Antonio should speak out if I'm. Uh, <laughs> misframing it but um i don't know i think it's uh it could be i've i've been hearing this more often why are the otts not moving into the networks themselves right and i think uh, with the exception of google somewhere in the us uh, we haven't seen that much there i think it would raise all kind of other questions if they were to do this uh, and, and of course um uh, entry is not that easy so i think <clears throat> i don't think it would be an immediate effect of some kind of levy um that they would consider this but uh you never know right it could be a sort of side effect and it comes back to my earlier point that um to have so a potentially um revolutionary proposal you need to look at it from multiple angles which is why a consultation and a proper process is important right so maybe it's a bit of a cliche but i think taking it's, from this debate it's not yeah and i think that they a very broad yeah. consultation I try to be a, a little bit brief also with the interest of time and David's question was also interesting because I like actually what he's saying here. Why should we, if it's related to the point I made about the OTTs paying, 
and then potentially going off the market um, and whether that would be a bad thing. And he makes the argument that it wouldn't be per se a bad thing, right? Why would you fa favor OTTs over telcos? I think it's a very good point. And when I made my intervention just a minute ago, I didn't mean to say that all OTTs should be protected. I think that OTTs come and go. Uh, it's the, the nature of their business. Of course, uh, some of them are there more entrenched, so to see, or uh, uh, in a better position than some others. But then again, I think that the OTT space is quite dynamic. So you never know what will happen in uh, four or five years from now. If you look at the, I've seen pictures of uh, OTTs who were pretty dominant uh, five or 10 years ago, and there were a lot of different names there, right? So it's a different dynamic, but I agree with David that uh, it shouldn't be per se that OTT should be protected against telcos. No, My point was I'm... more related to the traffic no, being but the I can also being the remember denominator when... and not the uh, profit taking into account. I think that's that's uh, what I try to make. I think we can all remember when uh, AOL was the largest provider of retail internet access in Europe. You know, so you know what I mean. Things change yeah. in this market. Um, okay, we have two minutes left. So if anybody would like to say yeah, a final totally. word, but I really need to be really quick. Yeah, very quickly, Tony. There are two questions. So on the co-financing question, and then on the on the question from Rudolf on the energy. So on the co-financing question, so uh, at ECTA we were opposed to the uh, to the to, to the co-investment article as it is defined in the code because there is an economical incentive for the operator to capitalize the uh, to uh, to mutualize their capex. Eh? So because if you yeah, same, achieve the same sales and, and, and you share your capex with another player, but you def definitively increase your return on capital employee. So we thought that there was absolutely no need to have a regulatory incentive to uh, push uh, parties in, uh, in co-investment. We also absolutely agreed that co-investment would mean, uh, in fact, ownership of assets, which is a, a why co-financing is not a co-investment. And on that, uh, we could also say that uh, with the way that copper prices have been calculated over the last 20 years, that it was a kind of co-financing uh, avant la lettre, eh, before it was embedded in the code. And uh, we might even ask if the alternative operators that co-financed a lot, the copper networks, are not allowed to ask for a return today. That's what, one. What? Okay. Yeah, and on the on the second question, very quickly, uh, Rudolf, uh, I have to say that the, the technologies uh, push for uh, less uh, energy consumption. So migration from copper to fiber would definitely significantly reduce the energy consumption. Uh, for the same amount of data, uh, moving from 4G to 5G will also reduce the energy consumption and so on. But that's not the point that I wanted to make with my uh, uh, hummingbird uh, uh, legend, is the fact that uh, all little steps needs should be done. And so even if overall uh, there are solar evolutions that push, push down, that does not mean that if we can further push down and even uh, avoid that, uh, there would be a, a rebound effect that it should not be done. Uh, thank okay. you. I, I can almost feel the cold coming off Alessandro, so he's doing his bit. And so, but I'm going to give the last word to Pierre and Luigi to close us out. No, no, but they don't need that last word. Let me just say that uh, this is a, just an opening of discussion. We had uh, so many topics and so difficult that uh, what I can see, say is that we commit to study these issues better and to be part of the future discussion. And anyway, I remind you, We'll start with the metaverse next week. Excellent. Okay, so I want to thank all of the speakers. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a round of applause because uh, the audience can't. So, okay, thank you. I pass back to Anna. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much, Tony, for excellent management of the roundtable, really great on time, and to all the speakers, because I think it was a very high-level debate with very many interesting uh, insights. Uh, although I'm not a panelist, if I may, I would just like to have some brief comment because these are topics that I'm really very passionate about. So um, a time ago, I was reading this article uh, written by Quaka and Valetti on unscrambling the eggs, breaking up consummated mergers and dominant firms. And there was a quote that I really like, which is that the criterion is not whether a policy is costless or perfect, but rather whether it is superior to the real world alternatives. The problem we have in regulation is that, of course, 
when these alternatives are unknown, we have to regulate under radical uncertainty. So we don't know exactly in which direction this internet will evolve, whether it will be metaverse or something else, but it, there, it's definitely a challenge of regulating, uh, regulating something that we don't know what it will look like. So in order to better understand the problem, if there is any and what it is, I think that there will be an increasing pressure on the authorities, whether it's competition and regulatory authorities, to become increasingly data-driven because we talk about data from the perspective of big tech, but public authorities will need to invest their cap capabilities in data analysis, which may be difficult because more money for data analysis is in the private sector, not in the public one. So I think there will be more public uh, funding needed for the authorities. And this brings me to my last point. Given the complexity of the debate we are facing, I think we really need to have more collaborative regulation between different types of authorities competition, regulatory, data protection, cybersecurity. So there will need to be a more, uh, more dialogue and more common language. So I think uh, it will be very interesting times we are looking forward to. So with that, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank all the participants who have stayed with us till the very end. And those who are interested can join the event that Pierluigi has mentioned that will take place next week. So thank you once again. <laughs>